stuff. Who wasn't here for last week? Okay. Maybe you get, you get kind of halfway commitments. Okay. Like yeah, I was, cool. I mean, this this hand halfway up means I wanted to be here, but I couldn't make it, so I was here in spirit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Last week was rough for most people, so this would be good. Um, awesome. if, for those of you guys who don't know Dr. Jerome, um, he's a staff clinician at the Carrick Brain Center. He uh, He's one of my Atlanta friends, um, and we used to be you know, down at Life, and then now he's here working at this clinic, helping a bunch of people. Super, super smart, um, very, very willing to help students out. He gets a lot of joy from helping people, a very selfless guy. Um, so I think, and he's a great, great, great speaker. So if you guys want um, to like ask questions and stuff, he's very personable. He'll probably know your, all of your names by the end of this hour long period. It's not like no pressure, just yeah. kind of an expectation, right? Just a little bit, right? Yeah. So uh, here's Jerome. Cool. Good to see you guys. So I, I, I normally don't wear a mic, but it actually will be a little easier for me today if I don't have to shout. So um, yeah, so it's good to meet you guys. I've met some of you guys in the room, some of you I haven't. So uh, what I was going to do, Jason asked me to come out and just touch base with you guys about just various applications for vestibular disorders as it applies to chiropractic. So I'm going to ask you guys, I like to, for any of you guys that have seen me talk before, I like to ask questions. Uh, ironically enough, it's, a, it's an approach that I, I learned a long time ago, but I love seeing from Dr. D'Onofrio, who's actually on the other side of the building. Does so anybody know who Dr. D'Onofrio is? Everybody knows Dr. Everybody knows Dr. D'Onofrio, right? Okay, so I've known Dr. D'Onofrio for about six years, and I love the way he asks questions. He, he lets you ask questions, and then he just answers and kind of rabbit trails off of that. So uh, we're going to do a similar sort of approach with that. And y'all give it up for chance. He is hand-holding this thing right here, okay? <laughs> Steadiness at its finest. Okay, so we'll use uh, Chance as an example here. Can anybody tell me all the systems that are involved when Chance has to hold that stable? Throw anything out. So, okay, proprioception. What's your name? Caleb. Caleb. Okay. Caleb says proprioception. What else, guys? Muscular. Vestibular, muscular, musculoskeletal. What else? What's the big one that nobody's mentioned yet? I, I, I think I heard like the last half of it over here. Cerebellum, okay, it was him, but it sounded like you just projected it, which is pretty awesome. Okay, so you got proprioceptive, you've got all the visual systems because he's got to be able to coordinate his eyes with his hand, musculoskeletal, but you've also got other things that are involved, okay? You've got cardiovascular. Why would anybody think that we've got cardiovascular involved with him being able to hold that? Circulation. Circulation. And what were you saying? The more complicated answer than I just said. Okay, that's <laughs> okay. What did you say back there, Bill? Muscles need blood. It's the basics, right? You gotta shunt blood. In order to maintain a contraction, you gotta have enough resource to it. What's your name, bro? Matt. Matt. So here's the thing that I would love to share with you guys, which whenever I talk to other students myself, constantly always being a student and a lifelong learner myself, uh, especially when it comes to neurology, this stuff can get way, way, way too complicated, way, way, way too fast. Okay? So Chance is holding the camera up, and he's gotta have cardiovascular response, it's because muscles need blood. Not really that complicated. You can go into all the other things that you have to do, but basics are you need blood. So the reason I mention that for something as simple as that, when you guys start looking at stuff as chiropractors and you start looking at vestibular systems or balance systems and other aspects, how are you doing, sir? Um, what I want you guys to do is start thinking through all the concepts of it. Start thinking through it from a baseline foundation. Okay, if somebody walks into your office, as soon as they open the front door to your office or they come into clinic, how many people are here in clinic? He's still got his Halloween outfit on, so he's, he's, he's just dressed up. But, so you're in clinic. Anybody else in clinic yet? Okay. So when you guys are going through, going through clinic, let's say a patient walks through the door, what are some of the first things that you can start to do when a patient walks through the door that you can start to assess a vestibular system? Let's just, just think purely conceptually. Okay? Okay, so watch their gait and their posture. Okay? What's the primary difference between gait and posture? Okay, posture is static, gait is dynamic. Okay, is your vestibular system being used when you're static? Yes or no? Yes. Completely static? It is? Yes. No, it's not. Your vestibular system has to, your, where is your vestibular system housed? In your ear. In your ear, right? And the three, what are some of the components of the vestibular system that you guys might have heard last week? Canals. So you got three canals, anterior, posterior, horizontal. horizontal. Okay, utricle saccule. What else? Say again. I'm sorry. Say again. 
Yeah, so organ of 40, you've got the cupula, you've got the ampulla, you've got all these different mechanics, okay? What is the vestibular system's primary role, if you guys could think of what it, what it does? Like your eyes work on Senses movement, and it does work with the eyes, but the visual system is primarily the driver for the eyes, but the vestibular system senses movement. So, if I'm looking at static posture, am I moving? Okay, so these are some of the things you think through, right? So, if you're checking posture, posture is a static response that the person has. Is there any other systems that are involved when you're doing static posture? Like, what other systems could you think that are involved? Musculoskeletal. Musculoskeletal. Respiratory. Proprioceptive, respiratory, so you've got, you've got lungs and other things. What else? You've got cerebellar, right? The cerebellar maintains postural tone. What else maintains postural tone? Anybody know? Skeletal. Skeletal is, but what, what maintains the postural tone of your skeletal system? Because skeletal is a bone, but musculoskeletal is the muscles attached to the bone. Okay? Does anybody know what actually maintains the muscle tone in the body? PMRI. The gamma. You almost said it. PMRI? PMRI. This guy's hitting like 8 out of 10 right now. No. It's awesome. Um, and I've already forgotten your name. Tell me again. Caleb? Caleb? Yeah. Okay. Right on. So, uh, you guys have to forgive me. I'm not firing on all cylinders today, so it's going to be dragging a bit. I apologize. Um, but, yeah, so you've got a ton of different systems with PMRF, okay? So here's some of the things where you start tying it in. I'm giving you guys kind of a rabbit trail thing, but I'm going to tie it all back in here for a second for you, okay? So why would we care about the PMRF when we're looking at the vestibular system as a chiropractor? And you guys don't have to say the right answer, and you don't have to say it in a string of things that make sense. If you can only think of one key word, that's fine. You can throw that out, too. But if we were thinking about postural tone, or we're thinking about muscle tone, and Caleb mentions the PMRF, why would I care about that as a, as a vestibular therapist or as a chiropractor? Okay, so the PMRF houses autonomics. Okay, Bryce makes a great point. Why do I care about autonomics as somebody who's dealing with vestibular patients? You have hyper or more tone or less tone in your muscles, which will make you... Yeah, so you're going to change tone in PMRF, because PMRF, what are the, does anybody know the four main functions of the PMRF? Inhibit. Pain. Okay, so we're going to go with inhibit pain, but the technical answer is inhibits a afferent nociception, right? So not all afferent uh, nociception is pain, but pain is primarily the easy way to say it. Okay, then we've got global muscle tone, we've got flexors, anterior above T6, posterior below T6, and then what's the fourth one? The Renshaw. Say again? The Renshaw? Yeah, so Renshaw sauce, which is global muscle tone. Okay, so and I've missed one there. So we've got global muscle tone, pain, flexors above and below the T6, and what's the fourth one? No autonomics, right? IML. Okay? So here's the thing. If you're talking about PMRF, if we're talking PMRF, what nerves are in the PMRF area? Does everybody know? What's PMRF stand for? Ponto. Okay. So what nerves are in Ponto? Five through, somebody said it? Five through eight? Okay. So what's medullary? Give me a guess. 9 it's through 12. <laughs> it says 9 through 12, right? Okay, and, and I'm going to bounce around with a couple of, of, of things that is just super basic, but I want to give to you guys because it will help, especially when you take your boards and things like that. If you go 2, 2, 4, 4 for your cranial nerves, you'll always remember your cranial nerves, okay? Two above the brain stem, which are the first two, which are which? Olfactory and optic, okay? The next two, which are in the mesencephalon, which are which? Ocular motor and... Say again? Chocolate. Okay, so you got four. Okay, so two, two, four, which is five through eight. So we won't list all of those, but then medullary is nine through 12. Okay, what nerve is primarily responsible for the vestibular system? Eight. Eight. Vestibular cochlear, right? So if we've got a nerve that's primary nuclei is located in the pons next door to the medulla, because 8 and 9 are the bridge between the PMRF. It's the main nerve that's right in the middle of the pontomedullary medullary reticular formation where you go from the pons to the medulla. Could it be that the vestibular system has something to do with the PMRF? It's reasonable, right? If you live in a neighborhood, you should probably know what's going on with that neighborhood. It's fair to say that you want to know who your neighbors are and what they do. Here's a really super easy example of where all of this ties in. Okay, so we've talked about postural tone, We've talked about static versus dynamic movement.
talked about autonomics, blood flow, respiration. We haven't talked about all the things that come in with cognition and everything else like that. But have you guys ever been in a situation where you've been up really, really high somewhere, and you look over the edge? What happens for some people? As soon as they look over the edge, they freak out, right? Some people freak out. The heart rate increases. They have an immediate visceral response. It's called going vasovagal. Okay? Um, sometimes you'll have somebody go vasovagal when they're sitting on the toilet, and they go to defecate, and they pass out. Has anybody ever had a patient that, that's had that happen? Okay, one of my concussion patients passed out on the toilet, hit his head on the bathtub because he was trying to defecate. Changed the blood supply because we were talking about shunning blood from the source and just giving blood to, to the gut and other things like that. But you change your intrathecal pressure, you change all that, you get vasovagal, and then they end up with a syn what's called syncope. Guy passes out using the bathroom and wakes up with a concussion. Not the best kind of day. But when we're talking about all these things, the reason I say, as a vestibular patient, as a chiropractor, why does it matter? Because when you start going through a laundry list of symptoms with your patients, and you start to say, okay, well, I have digestive issues, or I have visual issues, I have blurriness, I have changes in postural tone, which change my cervical curve, or change my lumbar curve, and I'm starting to go through all these issues where I have a gait that's abnormal, I've got increased flexor tone, I've got issues with hamstrings, all these things start to paint a picture for you guys of what the patient looks like. Does that make sense? Okay. So there's a couple of things to look at there. So with vestibular systems, um, obviously, the main things that are tied in with vestibular systems are visual systems, cerebellar sy systems, and proprioceptive systems. Okay? So, that being said, let's kind of work through a couple of the things that are involved. Okay? Can you quickly touch on the difference between proprioceptive and cere cerebellar? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, okay, so cerebellum is essentially coordination of movement, especially fine motor movement. Proprioception is knowing where you are in order to accomplish that task. Okay. Proprioceptive tends to be very, very heavily tied into, into somatic senses, like skin sensations. So if you guys close your eyes, okay, put your right hand up in front of your face. If you move your hand to the right, can you tell it's to the right? Okay, with your eyes closed, if you move your hand to the left, can you tell it's to the left? Okay, that's proprioception. Being able to know where you are, and another answer is, being able to know where my hand is in relation to myself, where my hand is in relation to the world, and where my hand is in relation to the rest of my body. Like, is it an extension of my wrist or is my hand attached to my shoulder? Because right, you guys, when you see like super, super extreme examples of this, you'll see somebody who might have an alien hand, right? They have no recognition that their own arm is pulling out their own hair. If you guys ever want to see a really good example of alien hand or alien leg syndrome, YouTube a video that says dog biting own foot. Actually, can, is this hooked up to the... Why we still got this dude up here? Look at that, man. That's a giant hit. <laughs> this guy and his thing. Let me change this quick. I'm going to show you a video quick because this is just. Yeah, you're good. Okay. You're going to post this PowerPoint on the. Uh, yeah, that's the most valuable one. No, that picture is terrible, man. I can't even believe it. Oh, come on. I look skewed and like 35 pounds heavier than that. That's terrible. Okay, so I'll show you guys if you haven't seen this quick. Does anybody have any questions, by the way? I know I'm kind of. I'm going to go in randomly here for you. Download Flash, really? You need Flash? I don't know. Probably a lot of people. Okay, this is a great example of somebody whose proprioceptive system has a blocked Flash button. <laughs> really not useful. Okay, anybody got any questions? Okay. So let's go back while I'm downloading this. <laughs> Apparently you Jason, can't get on YouTube? Jason's, no, man, you don't have a flash player. We're in circa 2008 here, bro. Um, <laughs> yes. It goes back to the question I was just asking about cerebellum versus proprioception. Your yeah. proprioception is going through yourself, cerebellum. Yeah, right? okay. absolutely. So it's more kind of like sensory versus motor? Well, it's both, right? So here's the thing. One of the things that we try to do in neurology a lot of times is we try to separate a system and say that we're going to address the vestibular system, we're going to address the cerebellar system. I'm going to do an eye movement that's more for the right cerebellum versus the left cerebellum. There are biases or biases to those things, but you're affecting the entire brain all the time. So you can't do one without the other. But primarily, cerebellar is going to be motor coordination. But then the thing is, is there's tons of really good research which might be in one of the files <laughs> that I gave you, um, about how the cerebellum coordinates thought. You know? If anybody says, well, I have brain fog all the time, I can't think clearly. 
students much. Say again? We have, we have some of those on the web page. Actually. Yeah. So coordination of thought. So, but then the thing is, is there's an argument that there's an argument that could be made. Pause it for just a second for me. I just don't think you know how to use a Mac, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to ignore that, that <laughs> heretical statement you just made. Um, but when you're talking about things like that, um, totally lost my train of thought right there. <laughs> um, cognition. Cognition, thank you. So when we talk about coordination of motor activity, you can't have a thought without having a neurochemical response. So to some degree, even on a chemical level, you're having a motor response. Now, there's some argument that will obviously be made as to whether or not that's a motoric event, but the cerebellum coordinates all sorts of things. So I would go with coordination on cerebellum, and then sensation, which is involved with, with somatotopic maps, and then collicular maps, and all the things that you do. Because for instance, I've got a patient that I'm working with this week. He is a Navy SEAL who was shot in the right eye. The bullet came out of his parietal and temporal lobe, okay? And they did reconstructive surgery. And when I'm doing therapies on him, I have to take a completely different approach than I would with somebody who's got two working eyes. Okay, so he's got a completely prosthetic eye. So let me ask you guys a couple of questions, which you may or may not have covered in this, but these are just, again, basic things that are good to understand when you're dealing with a vestibular patient, especially when you're going to start looking into what you're going to be doing with your therapies as a chiropractor. Okay? So if I've only got one working eye, patient's had his right eye taken out, the bullet went through his brain, came out of his temporoparietal occipital junction, okay, which is right here. What do I need to be thinking about when I put this patient on the table or I start to do an exam with him? Anybody got any ideas? Like what might I see, a, let me ask a question in a different way. What deficits could I anticipate seeing that I need to evaluate? Blind spot. Okay, different blind spot. What would be different with his blind spot, Dan? Right, so he's not going to get it with the left eye, right? So we know that the left eye is out of the equation. But do we process both fields of vision with the right eye? Okay, do you have do you have do you have part of do you have a nasal and a temporal tract for each yes. eye? Okay. So we process both fields of vision with the with one eye, right? So if I'm looking at a blind spot, what might I anticipate being different in a blind spot with somebody who's who's missing a right eye? Could be shifted, right? Okay. So, and then the other thing is, is if we don't have the right eye, what, what two portions of vision have we lost? Per peripheral, so let me ask a different question, okay? Does vision come in straight or does it come in on an angle? Does it come in from the same side or from the opposite side? Okay, it comes in from the opposite side. So if I lose my right eye, I lose the vision coming in at an angle for the nasal tract on the right side and then the temporal tract on the right side. Okay, so I'm losing everything to the left. So now this ended up coming out, and it hit his temporal and his parietal junction. So there's a possibility that we could lose the entire side. He could have a hemianopia on that side. But when doing the visual exam with him, he's lost just a portion of the upper left part of his vision. He can't see over here. So what? What if I can see down here pretty clearly, peripheral, but I can't see up here pretty clearly, which one is affected more than the other? Right temporal, right? Okay. Temporal parietal when you do the blind spot. So I know automatically his parietal lobe is more intact than his temporal lobe. So if I wanted to double check that I'm not missing that, what's another thing that I could do visually that would assess my parietal lobe? Pursuits, right? So I see Tyler motioning it. Okay. So pursuits to which side? Same side or opposite side? If I'm doing the right, if I am I if I'm assessing the right parietal lobe, am I doing right pursuits or, or left pursuits? Right. Same side. So right pursuits. Okay. Pursuits are always to the same side, psychology to the opposite side. All of them are coordinated with a lot of different things. Okay? So these are the things you got to start thinking through when you're looking at a patient. If I've only got one eye, do I run the risk of having a change in what my balance and proprioceptive vestibular systems would be? Because right? when I close my eyes, what am I now relying on more than anything for my, for my balance? Vestibular and? Okay. What's a way to automatically check if it's going to be a proprioceptive issue before, more so or a difference in the system between uh, proprioceptive and vestibular? Put them on a phone pad. All right, so if you've got somebody, again, taking a look at a vestibular patient, they're standing on a flat surface, they're okay. You put them on a foam surface, and they're okay. And they close their eyes, and they lose 20% of their, their balance score. What's the system that just crashed? Vision, okay? 
They close, you put them from a static surface to a foam surface, eyes closed, and they do okay, but eyes open, they don't do so great. But system's not doing, doing its best. So vestibular is part of it, and then you also have proprioceptive, right? Because you go vestibular on a hard surface, eyes open, you've got your vision and your proprioceptive. You put them on a foam, you're challenging proprioceptive more, you close their eyes, you're challenging the visual more. So these are things you can start to look through. I've got a guy with one eye missing. I'm taking a look at his, per, his pursuits to see how his parietal lobe is doing. I'm taking an inventory of everything that he's doing. Because when you start working with patients and you start checking pre and post as, as a doctor, you're going to have to start to assess what's the best avenue for me to work with this patient to get the best kind of results. Because if he doesn't have a functioning temporal lobe and he's not miss, he hasn't got a functioning right eye, how much do I want to do with temporal lobe activity on the right side? It's not to say that it couldn't be effective. It's just to say that it might not be the best use of time. Does that make sense? Okay. So an example for proprioception and somebody not being super aware of what it is that they've got going on. I mean, I'm not so good with a Mac, but did you have this in Safari? <laughs> yeah, you were just going up to the different tile. Same, same thing. Crazy dog places. Did you open it in Firefox? Check it out. Joker. Really? <laughs> oh, excuse me. Well, it's it's a second screen over here. My bad. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Has anybody seen this video? Yeah. Yeah. Nope. Uh, <clears throat> Social networking. If you're on this, I need to do a neuro eval on you. And this dog full on thinks that that is another dog trying to take its bone. Okay? You can actually see the entire paw is open. <laughs> Wait for it. Now here's the crazy thing. Okay? When you talk about proprioceptive and you talk about how the brain works and how we talk about perception, if you feel like we talked about with PMRF, if you feel pain, what is normally your response? Do you move closer to the thing, the stimulus creating you pain, or further away? Okay. So I want you to watch what this dog does when it starts to introduce pain into its own body. Okay. Like right now, it's not a pain situation. It's just it's it's a it's a fear situation. Okay. Does it let go? No. It starts chewing. So everybody's laughing, but poor little Billy here is on the road to wherever he's going. He's declining pretty fast. That's that's clearly not the way it's supposed to work. So and for that was the rabbit trail answer to proprioception. You should be able to feel your own leg, but there's some cognition issues going on there with that poor doll. So anybody have any other questions? You can ask whatever you want. He's gonna. I don't want to throw some loop here, but. You said, you know, you might want to stay away from that part of the brain since that's pretty damaged. Yeah. Um, but it's some, sometimes we talk about, well, if that's just that's damaged, that's what we want to work from. Yeah, absolutely. So, so that, Bryce makes a great point. If you guys want to take a look at an area that's got a huge deficit, even potentially what most doctors would say has been rendered useless, then the easiest thing that you can do is start to test that system. Just like tuning a piano. You change the tightness of the string, hit the key again, and see what happens. Right? You start testing those things, redo a blind spot map. Start doing those things and seeing, okay, what, what hangs out in the right side for most people in this area of the brain? Does anybody know what other area, functional area is in this side of the brain for most people? Wernicke's. What does Wernicke's do? Memory and what? Memory and what? Speech. Yeah, so, I'm sorry she said it at the same time. So no. memory, memory and speech, okay? So, could, is it possible that this patient could have any issues with memory and speech? Okay? Two, two biggest complaints that he's got that he wants to do. I can't tell you what his job is because it would give you too much information for who he is now. But let's just say he's got to write a lot of reports and he needs to know how to process those reports quickly. Right now he's in a situation where he's having to redo the report 12 to, 12 to 14 times to make sure he's got all the detail in there because he's having trouble actually getting the words on paper, and he's having trouble articulating his thoughts and getting it down on paper. Reasonable considering that he's had a bullet go through that part of his brain, okay? Another piece of information, when somebody says that they have issues with speech, what's a really, really good differential question that you can ask them? Are you understanding what I'm saying? So that's part of it, it's, a, it's asking somebody if they're able to actually process what it is that you're saying to them. What's another one? 
Are you able to think about what you want to say or right. not say? Right. So is it that you're not able to actually articulate what you're thinking or you're not actually able to bring the words to memory? Okay, so there's a difference between receptivity, there's a difference between expressive and receptive aphasias and things like that. They're all different parts of the brain. So the more that you guys study and the more that you guys kind of figure out the basics of the way the brain works, uh, it's, I, I tend to get in a lot of trouble with a lot of other functional neurologists and chiropractors who really, really like to know all the pathways. Um, and I don't really think it matters if you know the pathways if you don't know what each area of the brain actually does, okay? That's like saying I can get from A to B, but I have no idea what A to B does. Like, I don't even know where A to B is, but getting between the two, I'm really good at. It. And honestly, yeah. that's for, for students, that's what trips a lot of people up, because yeah. they try to go into fifth gear from knowing nothing to trying to know something super, super complicated. Yeah. So if you don't know basically what it is on like a second grade level, don't learn a pathway. So absolutely. Yeah, and you guys can start to do that. I mean, it's the, it's the luxuries of knowing your ABCs before you start learning complex languages like you know, French or Arabic or other things like that. You've got to know how to construct a sentence and the point of each component before you start making really, really complicated deductions about what it is that you're dealing with. Right, if you want to figure out with a patient how they got from A to B, you need to understand the entire neighborhood, understand what each of the components are and what role they play. So you can start to say, well, if somebody comes in and they have a vestibular complaint, the patient comes in and they say, I've got dizziness or I've got vertigo, what are the other things that I can look into? Does this person have digestive issues? Do they have anger issues because they're constantly having an issue with their PMRF because they can't shut blood properly because they don't know where they're at in space? They can't balance themselves, so they're diverting blood from their brain and from their lungs and from their gut. So they end up with indigestion, they end up with anxiety, they end up with all of these issues that tie into who they are as a person, and they're coming into you to deal with dizziness, right? But then when you fix them, they're like, I no longer have any issues with car sickness, I sleep better, I'm not as irritable, I can think clearer. This is why everybody thinks chiropractic is a miracle process. Because you fix one problem that ends up having a cascade effect, and all of a sudden you're the miracle worker. No, what you did was you moved a bone and you affrontated a system that needed some information so that it could do what it does well anyways. Right? So let's make sure that we keep our humility in, in, in check there. That's my soapbox. I'll get off of it. Okay. Um, but the thing is, in order for you guys to consistently, one of my favorite quotes that I've learned in, in the last five years is that we don't work within miracles. We work within expected clinical paradigms. Right? So what you do, if you know really well what that patient's going through, you know them biomechanically and neurologically, when you get a result with a patient, it doesn't shock you. You're like, well, I'm actually shocked if I don't get that result because that's the way the system's supposed to work. So start thinking through that paradigm. So that being said, what I'm going to do, how much time do we have? 45 minutes. Another 45 minutes? Okay, cool. <laughs> so I, I tend to find that it, it, it's, it's kind of it's kind of cute for you guys to listen to me talk the whole time, but it doesn't really help you guys go back with anything afterwards. So I'm going to go into more of a practical paradigm with you guys. Does, uh, do you have a, a manual on you? Does anybody have a manual on them? Awesome. Thank you. So, right on. You guys can't trust a dude to put this together. <laughs> and really, really quick, do you guys know who wrote the majority of that manual? That guy. So if you guys were putting two and two together, like, just... That was facetiousness. But yeah, so um, so if you guys get a chance, thank him after, because he's, he's the one that did a lot of this, that was able to to get us a manual so fast over basically one break over try because of this guy. Thanks, bro. Yeah, yeah man. I'm going to help you guys. He's the kind of guy where we're like, yeah, we're thinking about a manual, and then you see him the next day, and he's like, well, I wrote a 100-page outline. <laughs> like, you want to be here like, what? And he's like, yeah. Their, that's his physical exam. Sorry, guys. I'm, I wrote about it. I don't have the pages around. I'm trying to remember which page the... 92. 92? 92. Okay, nope, it's 80. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> How do you determine integrity of the vestibular system? Okay, so what I want to do is go through a couple of things with you guys. Um, you guys aren't in clinic yet, but one of the biggest things that I've found while, uh, while being in clinic, uh, especially at a chiropractic school, is correct me if I'm too far off base here, but you guys are really required to get a certain amount of numbers as quickly as possible, but the actual process of getting a patient better is a little lower than actually getting your numbers, right? So being able to help a patient is cool if you can accomplish it, but graduating and getting your numbers is better, right? So time is of the essence when you're working with a patient in the clinic. So what I'm going to do is go over about 10 or 11 or 12 things that you guys can do to do a quick scan on a patient in a, an abbreviated fashion. So I'll give you guys an idea of what you can do, okay? 
So Jason, let me borrow you, and then we'll go over this with you guys, and I want to see if we can do a couple of things, okay? So when I do a quick scan, if I've got a small amount of time with somebody, I love to get as much bang for buck as I can. Testing the vestibular system and the cerebellar system and the visual system will give me a heck of a lot of bang for buck. Bang for buck. Bun? Bun. Bun. <laughs> we need I, 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 I'm, I'm, looking, I'm looking at this right here. <laughs> <laughs> Told you I was struggling. I'm really in. So, um, no, <laughs> it's all good. Um, if you guys want to Google key RE malformation, it creates interesting days sometimes. Um, that's what I got. Uh, so, what I like to look at is all of the things that work with balance, vision, cerebellar, proprioception, because all of those are going to be primary drivers. I don't know if you guys have thought through it, but does anybody has anybody thought about just the basics of what a subluxation might be? Like not philosophically, right? Not, I'm not talking about a disconnect between innate intelligence and something keeping the force that's within us working. I'm not talking about the esoteric stuff. I'm just talking basically. If we're talking about the most, and I'm going to go on a rabbit trail for a second, so you just stand up pretty. Um, if you guys look at something like we look at with innate intelligence, or something that's as incredible and as beautiful as a human body, and it's capable of doing everything that it does from taking an In-N-Out burger or whatever that is and making it into eye cells and ear cells and vestibular systems. It creates who you are as a person. No matter what you give it, it produces something that's a functional human being. It's a pretty incredible mechanic. I mean, it's a pretty incredible physiological experience. So if we take something that we claim as innate intelligence to be the most wisdom-filled thing on the planet, what might it potentially be doing with a subluxation? Right? Most of what the body does, you can break down into two very simple things, moving you towards pain or away from pleasure. Okay? It's trying to stabilize you, trying to create some sort of system where it can make sure that you're functioning as well as possible. So my point in what I say is subluxations at the base of who we are as a chiropractor might potentially be within a paradigm of innate intelligence and all of our infinite wisdom doing something to help you function as well as you can for the time being because it has to work with the resources that it has. So when you take that into consideration, you have to be very, very conscious that when you remove a subluxation from somebody, which I wholeheartedly believe in, that you're asking yourself if you're removing it at the right time, in the right place, and in the right way. Okay? Has anybody ever had, uh, had an adjustment and it ended up making them feel worse afterwards? Okay. Right? It's possible. It's not, not the end of the world. Okay? I've been put in the hospital a couple of times by some of the best adjusters on the planet. And it wasn't because they didn't give me the best adjustment that I've ever had in my life. It's because my system didn't receive it well. I've got part of my cerebellum in the wrong place. It didn't handle it properly. Okay? The fact that I have so much respect for the adjustment is because I understand exactly what it's capable of. But you've got to be able to ask yourself, if you're going to go in somewhere and you're going to do something, what is going to be the poten potential response? I need to have some sort of some sort of outcome measurement that I'm taking into consideration because I carry a lot of power and a lot of weight with the adjustment that I'm doing with the patient. I've got to, I've got to own that responsibility, right? So if you look at innate intelligence and you look at its ability to just do vision, just do balance, just do digestion, the simple things, there might be a consideration that it's putting it there for the time being because it's trying to stabilize your system. So if you remove it, when you remove it, you want to make sure that there's something there to support it. So when we do an adjustment for somebody, and let's say it's, a, it's an ASL at C1, somebody's got a, a lateral atlas at C1, okay? If that person has an issue with a change in postural tone, tone because of the vestibular system, you have to take into consideration if they're going to be able to do an adjustment on the right better than an adjustment on the left. So the point that I make with all of this, to kind of rabbit trail and get on a little bit of a soapbox with you guys, is when you start taking in, this into consideration, it's an idea to try and determine which side you want to adjust on. Just a super basic thing, right? Why would I care about adjusting somebody's atlas on the left versus the right? What difference does it make? Is there a difference? Right. What kind of difference would it make if I adjusted somebody's atlas on the right versus left? Back to week one, week two. Simply just where that uh, simulation is going to in the brain. Yeah, so we're talking about affrontation, right? In, in chiropractic, we talk about the, the force that we deliver into the body or the impulse we deliver in the way it's processed. But physiologically and neurologically, if you adjust somebody on the right, you're affrontating a different somatotopic map of their skin. You're going through different vestibulospinal and vestibulocolic pathways and reflexes. You're going through a bunch of different mechanisms to a different part of the brain. So if I'm dealing with a patient who has got 
let's just say, an incredibly ramped left brain. This person's got Asperger's. I mean, like Sherlock Holmes over here, okay? Their brain is screaming on the left side. Do I have a, ch do I have a chance of increasing affrontation to their brain if I adjust them on the right as compared to the left? Yeah. Simple, right? It's just basic stuff. So when you take an inventory of a patient and you go, this person's already got a huge bias, and they're all the way up on the left side of their brain compared to the right. It's just a very basic model of hemisphericity, okay? It's, it's, it's oversimplifying what's possible in neurology, but I'm just using it as a comparative, okay? If I've got somebody who, uh, through my assessment, has a screaming left brain who doesn't have a, a highly functioning PMRF because the left brain controls the left PMRF, so they end up with increased tone here. We're over-exaggerating here. Okay, so they've got tight hamstrings, they've got tight flexors, they've got decreased tone here. They've got increased MSRs in their leg and in their arm. What's that? Muscle spindle reflex. It's actually the new way of saying DTR. It's not a deep tendon reflex anymore. It's an MSR, muscle spindle reflex. So all of these things are starting to pattern out. If this is having the gas driven on it so hard, do I want to adjust this person on their atlas and see one on the right? Well, here's the thing. You might. You might, because it might actually give enough information to the left side of the brain to gate it and to start to calm those things down, slap the fool out of the driver and say, take your foot off the gas. Okay? It might. That's the thing. These are the questions that you need to ask. If we actually took the time to really understand the specificity of what we do during an adjustment, we would have a lot less miracle cases and a lot more regular everyday cases like that. That's everything really bad. Yeah. We talk a lot about that when we say, like, you might want to do this, you might not. And I feel like a lot of times we kind of leave it at that. People are kind of left wondering, like, well, then what do we do? So I think what he's talking about, said a little bit differently, is if you try one thing and you make them worse, you can try basically something else. You basically, you're trying to figure out what pathways you want to use to make somebody better. So if you go down one road and that road is a bad road, you might not want to take that road again. You know what I mean? So Yeah, and you can take a gauge like Jason was saying. You guys can take a gauge with your patients that if you start to, if you have somebody come in right out of the gate and they are just crashing and burning before you've even put your hands on it, you haven't even done an exam, you've got to take into consideration the vehicle that you're working with and the, the extent of the condition that that person walks in with. If they are a brand new car who just needs an oil change and they're getting a checkup, not as much of a concern to adjust somebody on either side. You can adjust them upside down if you want. You can do a flying seven. They're probably going to handle it because they can do it. But if you've got somebody who's coming in, coughing and spurting and choking, and they're barely, barely making it in the door, and they're covered in duct tape and bubble gum, and somebody's MacGyvered their entire life, it might be a consideration not to just go straight for atlas. Okay? The reason that most upper cervical techniques have so much more powerful responses than other techniques is because physiologically, C1 and C2 are the most powerful adjustment that you can do in the body. You get way more affrontations of the brain than you do doing distal extremities. If I spend my entire life in practice adjusting toes and fingers, I'm probably not going to get the same response that I would if I'm doing an AIO AI technique. Okay? It's just, just not the case. So you've got to be conscious of that. So me having gone all over the place for you guys today, the point that Jason makes is do something, do it within a confine of where you won't blow the, potion, the patient out so you can pre and post check in, and then start to increase your intensity and your severity just like you would if you were doing a personal training regimen for the patient. You wouldn't put them under a 500-pound rep. You'd see how much they can handle. You'd increase their endurance. And once they get really efficient at it, you increase their weight and you increase their reps. You make it more intense and you make it more, more efficient. Okay? So you can do that in a ton of different ways. So let me run through a quick scan with you guys quick that, that I do for these patients um, or any patient that you see. And then you guys can try and just see a variable amount of what that does for you. Okay? So I like it. Closer to see. No, if you guys you can see it from where you're at, I'm just going to go through it quick and then we'll answer some questions about it if you guys are wondering what I'm doing. Okay. Also, if you guys are watching, I want you guys to tell me what you see. Because it's very rare that I've ever seen anybody that does perfect. So Jason will probably have something. I would even probably have more than him. Okay. But what's a r one rule of thumb that you do with somebody who's, when you're doing a Romberg's? So if I'm doing an isolated Romberg's with a feet are touching. Ready to catch him. Ready to catch him. Okay. But what do I need to do with Jason before I do the test? Tell him about it, but even simpler than that, I'm, I'm asking, I need him to take his shoes off. Okay? Don't do a Romberg's with somebody's shoes on. Okay? You need to see how they respond without their shoes on. Unless it's somebody who wears a particular apparatus so constantly that they do better in it than they do barefoot. For instance, hockey players. Hockey players on a balance unit will do better in their skates than they will do barefoot. That's where they live. Okay? So you get somebody to take their shoes off. Thanks for cutting toenails, bro. 
the entire time. Yeah, that's that's sharp. I knew you were coming. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't you even know I was going to have you take your shoes on? <laughs> Cover prepared. You had your hopes on. That's awesome. Okay, so for Rombergs, I start with feet close, uh, together, and I'm just going to run through it quick, and then I'll, I'll talk to you guys about it, okay? So feet together, pick a spot on the wall in front of you. Close your eyes. Open. Close your eyes. Open. Okay, stand just on your right foot, left foot up. Keep your eyes open. Steady yourself. Close your eyes. Hold it for 10 seconds. Okay, open and switch. Keep your eyes open. Steady yourself. Close your eyes. Okay, open. Okay, turn 45 degrees so you face me so everybody can see. Put your arms up. Palms to the ceiling. Palms back down. Okay. Up and down as fast as you can. Okay, down here. Up and down as fast as you can. Okay, up here. Spread your fingers, close your eyes. Touch the tip of your finger to your nose. Okay, do it about half that speed. People will cheat if you do it too fast, okay? Okay, open your eyes. Put just this index finger up, drop that. Touch my finger, go to your nose, and go back and forth. Okay, I'm going to move my finger, you follow it, okay? Touch it that. So I don't go back until I touch it. Yeah, correct. Okay, other hand, same thing. Okay. All right, play the piano for me. That's right, better song. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hand up like this. Close it down. Wide as you can, big and wide and fast, ten times. Okay, other side. Okay, awesome. Okay, follow my thumb. Look at the thumb when you see it move, okay? Back to me. Back to me. Look at the opposite one. Back to me. Back to me. Okay? And then if I had an OPK strip, I'd do that too. Alright, and then also one thing that you can do that's bedside, I would obviously do a motion palpation, but um, put your chin to your chest. Yeah, actually, but they won't be able to see it, so it's okay. But I would do an OPK strip in all four directions, okay? Um, sorry. Can anybody remember what I just asked? Chest. Okay. Thank you. Chin your chest. <laughs> you can keep your right shoulder length apart. Okay, head all the way back. Okay, open your eyes. Okay. Your left ear to your left shoulder. Right ear to your right shoulder. Okay. Turn your head all the way over this side. And all the way over that side. Okay. So just a basic range of motion test, right? Any pain with any of that? Okay. So, those are just a couple of things that you can walk through. If you do it really quickly, it's less than two and a half minutes, all right? So, if you have patients that have a lot of issues, you're gonna see more than that. He tends to be healthier than most subjects, but there were things that we saw, okay? So, I'm gonna go through it again quick, okay? You don't have to close your eyes. Feet together. Which way did he sway initially? Okay, to the, to the, to the right, okay. My, my orientation, which way do you sway? Okay, this way, okay? That was the compensation, but the initial was to the left, okay? So when he closes his eyes, he's got a little to the left and he compensates to the right to have the postural correction on the right side. Because he changes, contracts on the right side, brings himself back as a larger sway. Okay, so don't confuse right as the issue, the left is actually the original, the original sway. Okay, standing on one leg versus the other, which one is easier? Was right more stable or was left more stable? Okay, so when he was supporting, he was on his left leg, which is right, so this was more stable? Yes. Okay, all right. So, then you can spread your arms. So arms up, anybody see any issues with the DDK? Pretty even, right? So this is one of the big things that I also use with this, especially with Jason, because he's pretty healthy. Don't see what's not there. Don't, don't see more than you need to, especially because we look at everything so subclinically. It's like, he's got to have something. Right? It might be that all he's got is just, a, a, I mean, barely any sway to the left, and that's it, right? You might not have anything else. And then you're doing performance enhancement. Then you're working with your patient who's in great condition, but you're just tweaking a tenth of a second off their quarter mile. What is that testing? So this DDK, this is an agonist antagonist test. So anytime you do something where you go through an agonist antagonist muscle test, so extension, flexion, supination, pronation, 
Um, that's testing a couple of different things. It's testing cerebellum for coordination. It's testing proprioception for understanding of where your or awareness of where your limb is. It's testing frontal lobe for being able to initiate that movement. Um, it's testing vestibular system for being able to see if you have inappropriate trunkal responses for when you do that. Uh, you could even test cardiovascular and other systems if somebody's wearing a pulse ox and you see if they have a change in heart rate or oxygen perfusion. So it's a lot of different things. But the most isolated one that you can do is this. It's called a UPDRS uh, pincer scale. It's what they use for Parkinson's patients. Got an entire grading system, which I can give you guys at another time. But this is scored on a zero to four. And it's really, really reliable, and it's vetted out, and it's standardized and accepted in the, in the clinical community. So if you put down that the patient had a grade three finger tap, and you put that in a report, it will, it will, they will take it to the bank because it's already vetted out and it's, it's, uh, it's confirmed in the scientific community. Uh, just as long as you grade it properly. Is it for, I guess, um, maybe like an article or something on, on that? On your PDFs rating scales? Yeah. Um, Bryce will have one in, in the files that I gave him, so we'll get him to get you guys one for sure, okay? Um, and then also, I have a write-up of all the instructions that I've been given on the grading system. So if Jason reminds me, I'll get you guys the grading system as well. Okay. So this little bit, it was pretty even. He was a little tighter on the left arm, but pretty even. Down here, same or any change? Okay, so a little touch less on the left hand, right? But here's the, here's the, here's the basics of neurology. You can put your arms down. Okay. When you're doing any of these tests, this is his right, this is his left. What's there a difference? That's the basics, okay? Everybody complicates it. These two sides should be able to do the same thing, but sometimes they don't. So if there's a difference, what was the difference? Was there a difference in speed? Was there a difference in accuracy? Was there a difference in latency? Was there a difference in position and process? All of those sort of things, and you can start to quantify, but basically what you're looking at is somebody who should be symmetrical from right to left, and you want to see if there's a change in that. Okay, so then we had him do the piano playing, right? And one of the things that you can look at, is, look at as well, so when he puts his arms up, we're talking about a vestibular patient. What are some of the things that you want to look at from head to toe with this person? And Jason's giving you one of them right there. Okay, and so you want to look at positional sway, right? If you guys look at more than just the tests that you're running, the patient's going to give you a ton of information. They really, really are. Okay? Somebody puts their arms up and they have a difference in height, you're looking at a parietal distribution where they may not have the best parietal map of their left arm. Because they came up, this is an arm raise test. You're combining an arm raise test with an EDK before you start. Now Jason actually had a little bit of posturing with his left hand compared to his right, where his right hand's like this and his left hand's like this. So that gives you information about a pyramidal posturing, different things like that. If you take a patient whose hand is like this, and you do three minutes of work with them and their hand comes out like this, have you made a change to the way that their brain works? Okay. The patient isn't aware of that until you introduce that to them, but you can use it as a pre and post check, like we were talking about. What do you actually do with that? Okay. So he puts his arms up. We're checking to see if he's got any kind of difference in arm size. If he's got any size, then you like Nadal, got one giant left arm. Um, if you guys know anything about tennis, check on Nadal. It's actually right handed, though, it's kind of cool. Um, so you're checking to see if there's any change in height, checking to see if there's head tilt, rotation, right? If he's got flexion or extension, if he's got a hypertropia versus a hyperopia, exophoria versus esophoria, is his eye center, or has he got one that's up, he's got one that's out, he's got one that's in, and all those things give you information while you're looking at the patient. The more you start to learn about tying all of it in, the more you paint a picture of what's going on with the patient. But that's just something that you can do initially. Then you can even see if you're standing behind somebody, is the crease higher in their hip? Is their foot internally rotated? Do they have a higher shoulder? Do they have an internally rotated shoulder? And us as chiropractors, why would I care if somebody's got an internally rotated shoulder and a high hip on this side, and they've got this kind of head position naturally? Why would I care? Say again for me, All right, so if he's got hypertonic muscles, are you guys allowed to adjust extremities at Parker? Mm -hmm. yeah. Right? Okay. I'm not sure if it's, a, if it's a heretical statement. You know, sometimes C3 is an extremity. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, it's tricky. So when you're doing this, you've got to take into consideration, if I've got a change in muscle tone, could that change the force of the adjustment that I'm going to do? Am I going to be doing a slow stretch versus a fast stretch? Because have you guys gone over the difference between slow stretch versus fast stretch adjustments? Yeah. Okay, fast stretch adjustment versus a slow stretch adjustment. Which one is going to turn, which one is going to provide more affrontation or feedback to the brain, the slow or the fast? Yes. Okay, what, and that's a trick question, by the way. I mean, that's really not a fair question. What, ki what, what kind of information, if I do a fast stretch adjustment, 
what will the brain do with that? Resets the spindles. Resets the spindles, right? Okay, so if I've got increased tone here and I do a fast stretch adjustment, I run an increased probability of decreasing temporarily the tone in this muscle. But that may just be a biomechanical fix for a neurological problem, so I may have to change the way the brain perceives the shoulder so that I decrease the tone tonically rather than just dynamically through an adjustment. But if I want to decrease the tone, possibly do a fast stretch adjustment on this side. Or you go cross board reflex, you do a slow stretch adjustment on this one, you increase the tone here, decrease the tone on the other side. Tons of different things you can do. But when you're looking at somebody's posture, and you're looking at somebody as a vestibular patient in terms of clinical application, all of these things tie into what you're going to be doing with an adjustment. Because if I've got somebody who's got a high hip and increased tone on their hamstring, am I going to have more difficulty with side posture on the right or the left? If I've got increased tone on the right. Let's say it's, let's say it's a pull versus a push. If I want to do a pull on Jason, which one's going to which one's going to fight me less? His left leg or his right leg? His left leg is going to fight you less because he hasn't got the de he's got decreased tone on his hamstring, so he may be able to be all you know gymnastic about it, get his his knee all the way up to his chest. But you go right side and try and do a side posture on somebody, and you're like, relax, I'm relaxed, relax, I'm relaxed, right? And you can't get their leg any more than 40 degrees off the ground. So you got to take into consideration what could you do to decrease the tone on the hamstring before you do an adjustment. So if I want to decrease the tone on the hamstring on this side, I go back to some of the original questions because this is a vestibular question, right? What vestibular system is involved with my right leg? Right or left? Which vestibular system controls the right side of my body? Right. Right. Yeah. So cerebellum and vestibular same side, frontal lobe, opposite side. So control in terms of the toric event is cortically is left. But for coordination of vestibular, it's right. Okay, and that's uh, that's something we may not have time to go through for, for a map, but that's okay. Okay, so right vestibular system controls right leg. Okay, what part of the brain controls posterior or posterior groups on the right side? Is it is it brainstem? Is it cortical? Is it both? Brainstem. It's both. No, okay. I thought that wrong last week. I did that the interior with right hand shape. If you were leaning circle, you have to get drawn back. Right. Yeah, no, and that, that's possible, but if you're leaning forward like this, you have to activate your right vestibular system to, to reorient yourself, so it's still controlled by the right vestibular system as a compensation for left. So you had it right, just there was a step in between that. Okay, so right leg, right vestibular system, but then we're talking right brain stem and right frontal lobe, controlling that right brain stem, changing that global tone. We also might have cerebellum. There's a ton of different things, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna kill you guys with detail, which I have already done, and I apologize. Um, okay, so we did the piano test, we did the finger tap. Okay, so left hand finger tap, did anybody see? Which one was, again, basic question, was, was there a difference between left and right? So do the left for us again. Okay, do the right again. Okay, what's the difference, with, is there a difference between left and right? Yes or no? Okay. Caleb says there's not, this is a little bit, it's minor, but it's, it's, it's a little bit there, okay? What does anybody see which if there's a difference in? The right is faster. What's another way of saying the right is faster? The left is slower, right? That's a great <laughs> answer. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, if I want to increase my speed, and I've asked somebody to do this, what's the fastest way to increase my speed? Decrease the amplitude. Decrease the amplitude, right? It's great to meet you, man. Hi, you too. Have a great night. Um, if I decrease the amplitude, right? Okay. So if you decrease the amplitude, that actually changes the way that you rate the test, with a decrease in amplitude actually changes your score. So it's a slight difference in the rate. Is he metric when he's on his thumb? Or is he off? Is he metric? It's pretty metric, right? Nothing big. Okay. Then we're checking the eye movements. So I'm him, okay? His eye is going to the right. Which part of the brain? Right one. When, when I was following you. Yeah, so this is I, this is Jason's eye, right? It moves to his right slowly. What part of the brain? Right parietal. Okay. It moves slowly to the left. Saccades back to the middle. Left frontal, right? Okay. Which cerebellum is the one that's involved with stopping the movement? Okay. So I'm gonna call. I'm gonna move my hands, and I want you guys to call out the part of the brain. Okay. We got parietal. We got frontal. And we got cerebellum. And we got sight in this, okay? Now here's the thing. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to change some things up. I'm not going to do just horizontal. 
Okay. And then if we had time, I'd actually start introducing canals with you guys too, which would be kind of fun. But I'm putting this boy out to sleep over here. He's, he's been working hard. It's raining outside, y'all. Okay. Suit, jacket. Okay. What? Right front. Right Right side. Right. 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 Right, right, right. Yeah, so here's the thing. You split the person down the middle. You do any slow movement to the right. It's white. Now, what was wrong with what I just said there? Can anybody pick it up? I said if I split the person down the middle, every fast, every slow movement to the right is right for right. Or what did I miss on that? They don't have the connection. <laughs> I'm not saying literally no, no, no. This isn't a magic act where I cut you down. Okay, let's go. If I take somebody's right visual field from center, everything to the right is right parietal. Okay? What have I missed there? Say again? Not just one eye. But here's the thing, guys. Any movement that's initiated to the right is right parietal if it's slow. So if I've got Jason looking all the way over here, look over here for me. Okay, and I start the movement here. Am I at midline? Am I still moving to the right? Okay, then it's right parietal. Okay, the direction and the initiation of the movement is contingent on the part of the brain that's actually controlling that. Okay, so it doesn't have to happen from midline. So if you have somebody who's got head rotation like this, naturally rotated to the left and naturally head tilt, where is their, where are their eyes biased to? Right. If, if I've got my head like this, where do my eyes go? Like this, right? Okay, so if my eyes are up here, does anybody know what canal that is? Okay, right anterior, right? So if I've got somebody who's static, they're not activating the vestibular system, but their head's in this position, what might they be tonically firing into? The right anterior canal. And the right anterior canal works with what cerebellum? Right, right, so right vestibular system, right cerebellum. So I end up creating a slight bias on that. So these are the sort of things we look at when you're looking clinically at a patient when they walk into your office as a chiropractor. When we talk about gait and we talk about postural assessment, all of those things come into play. If I've got somebody like this, is it possible that I could be providing a different set of feedback to their brain than if they were like this? Right? Tyler? So in this case, what came first, the overactive canal cause your eyes to go that motion and you have to get to the motion to facilitate that? Is that what's going on? That's kind of a chicken and egg kind of question. Yeah. And I like both. I like chickens and eggs. <laughs> Together. <laughs> on a biscuit. Yeah. Yeah. So, Finn and announced started making biscuits. Oh, dude. <laughs> I know. They got a secret menu, though. Okay. So, um, apologize. Interesting week. Okay. So, um, Here's again, I'll just wrap it up because I know you guys get to leave and I, I want to answer some questions if you guys still yeah, have, have any stamina and I do have to make an announcement, thank you. Um, when you guys go into clinic and you start looking at patients, the most important thing that you guys can start to do is just start to ask what's going on. Who's involved? What might this make a difference in? If I've got somebody with a postural assessment like this, who's at play? What part of the body is being used? Could this make a difference to this person's brain? And if so, how? You know, start going through those different things so that when you have somebody come in and you look at an x-ray and you see a change in cervical curve and you see a change in rotation for some segments, you start to ask why, okay? Because do bones move independently, on their own, without any other indication? Okay, that's called trauma, okay? It doesn't happen naturally. What moves a bone? What controls the muscle? The curve is controlled by the muscle, which changes the bone, but what controls the muscle? The nervous system, right? So I thought you said curve. You said nerve. Sorry. Uh, um, the nervous system controls the muscles, controls the tone, and controls the activation. So if you have somebody that comes in and consistently is out at C2 or C1, and you're delivering the best adjustment known to man, Jesus couldn't have done it better than you just did it. The person comes back in and they're out again because they're traveling with their travel card and they're just always out at C2, right? 
is it possible that the person has that subluxation at that particular location because of a change in muscle tone that's supposed to maintain the structural integrity of that segment? Is it plausible, right? If you guys have a cast on your arm and you take the cast off, increase or de decrease in muscle tone? Decrease. How long does it take for a muscle to degenerate? <laughs> 48 hours initially, but when do you start to lose more of your muscle mass? I don't have a lot of experience in this, Jason. Initially? Yeah, you got more muscle than me, man. How long, does it, how long does it take to lose the muscle mass if you're working out? Anybody work out here? It could be in the days. Anybody? Logan's, Logan like looks like he's, he's lifted a couple weights. Right? You know, it doesn't take forever, right? We're talking seven days to start losing muscle mass. 48 hours to, to start losing initial muscle mass. The reason I say this is if somebody has been subluxated, for more than seven days in the same segment, have they lost muscle tone? They have to. It's physiologically impossible to maintain the same integrity of muscle tone if you've got a, a segment that hasn't been activated in seven days. So you take somebody who's had a subluxation for two years and they haven't had that segment moved. When you move that segment and you have a change in your intertransversary and your multifidi and all those other things, is that muscle that hasn't been activated in 14 to 21 days or months going to be able to maintain the tone that the other side of the segment has been able to have for the last two years? Mm -hmm. Probably not. So when they have an issue with their transverse transversaria and, and your intertransversaria and your multifidus, and you make that adjustment and they come in next week and they're back to the same place, is it plausible that you understand why? Okay. So what would be the next question? You know that they're subluxated at C2. You want to fix that subluxation, but they can't hold the tongue. What's the way to do that? What would you do? Sorry, I hear a lot of whispers, and I'm really good at reading lips, but you guys don't open your mouth no, because I'm not ready to read. <laughs> Decrease tone on the other side or change the tone on the same side. Right? So basically what we think through is we've got to change the tongue. Okay? How do you change tone in, in, in intrinsic muscles, deep intrinsic muscles? Is there a way to volitionally control tone on intrinsic muscles in the spine? No. Any, even one? No. You can't do it. It's impossible. So if you're trying to work with the in intrinsic tone of a deep intrinsic muscle, is there anything that we can do reflexively that changes that? Fast stretching. We'll do it. Because you get past the paraphysiological space and you do the adjustment. What else? Vestibular stimulation, we can change posture responses. What's one of the biggest ways that you can affect deep intrinsic musculature? Hmm? I'll give it to you guys because we're going to run eye movements. Okay? 25% of the, 75% the, of the information when you, uh, I'm sorry, 25% of the information when you move your eyes reflexively fires into the spine to stabilize you. So vestibular systems and eye movements, that's why when you guys start doing adjustments with people and you start seeing what their eye movements are like, I guarantee you, you can take it to the bank if somebody's got incorrect eye movements, they're going to have subluxations because they're having postural responses to change the way that their actual integrity works and they can't stabilize themselves because they can't figure out the world visually. So it's probably important to learn how you can affect somebody with eye movements and with vestibular therapy, which is another conversation for another time because we're out of time. And Jason's been standing up here so excited for, for me to actually, sorry, it took me, it took me some time. Okay. It's been awesome.